So there wasn't one announcement I did forget. I heard this morning, it's Happy Father's Day today <laughs> for all the fathers. So uh, in a very real sense, we wouldn't be here without them. <laughs> So you can thank your fathers that you'll come to a, a Buddha centre. Maybe they're not even Buddhist. <laughs> so, uh, yes, we have a debt to our parents. And that's another talk I think one could give very easily. The Buddha and Buddhism in general encourages being uh, very grateful to our parents for the opportunity they've given us, for the fact that they've brought us up, shown us the world and sustained us during our childhood. So a very important um, thing that the, the Buddha encouraged. And as I say, I'll talk about that one uh, another time. It's a good one, though. But today, I was going to... Uh, last night, I did a talk uh, for the teens group. It's always a challenge doing things for teenagers because you really, you really, it's difficult to hold their attention. You have to have things that uh, really uh, grab the attention. And it's also difficult to know how they're taking it. <laughs> but last night, we had... Um, <clears throat> it was... Uh, quite a few videos, so the videos were very appropriate, I think, for the theme. And the theme that they're looking at, and it's a very, very good theme, is that they're doing the five precepts one at a time. And really, I thought, when I, when I thought about it, I thought, wow, sadhu for that, that's so important. You know, we overlook the importance of the five precepts. We think, well, we, you know, we take them every week or however often we take them. And we don't realize that these are actually crucial to our happiness and well-being here and now and in future lives. And they're a great blessing for the world, not only for ourselves, but for the world. If we keep those five precepts, if, uh, if the whole world kept it, as I say to people, it'd be like paradise. It would not be like samsara. <laughs> so, but the precept we focused on last night is one that is very difficult for most, most people to to wrap their minds around. And that was, uh, in Pali, of course, we just uh, chanted it in English, is Kame Sumi Chachara, where Amani Sikapadang Samadhi Ami. And this, of course, means that I undertake to refrain from uh, sensual, uh, pleasures in sensuality, um, which usually implies uh, sexuality. So sexuality is something that uh, people usually a bit uncomfortable about, especially teenagers, but it's a very, very important time to get those messages across about uh, sexual misconduct and what the Buddha had to say about sexual misconduct. So the talk that uh, I gave last night was meant to catch people's attention. I was hoping to have it up here, actually. It's called Hash Me Too, the Buddha's words on sexual misconduct. So I think many people know of Hash Me Too. Do you? Is it any blank looks? People think, what is he talking about? <laughs> so usually, actually, um, when we talk about sexual misconduct, people just think of adultery, you know, people having affairs, husbands or wives, committed partners having affairs. And, of course, that's included, but there's much more to it. And, of course, one of the things I stressed last night to the teenagers, I said, you know, the precepts, as I always like to stress here, are voluntary. We take them on because we see the value in them. If we don't value them, if we think they're of no benefit to us, we won't take them on. But in actual fact, if we really uh, look at the precepts, we can see the va enormous value to ourselves and to others, actually, for our happiness and theirs. And uh, also, it's, uh, one of the important things about uh, sexual misconduct, of course, it brings up the fact that uh, sexuality is one of the most powerful forces that drives samsara. <laughs> it's what's driving samsara, a big part of it, actually. And it's why we're reborn, actually part of why we're reborn, because of our attachment, because of our craving to sensual pleasures, that's one reason. And also, of course, very important one is our, our attachment or craving to existing. So this is how we come into existence, at least in a human form. Uh, Davas and other beings don't necessarily have like a sexual um, birth. They don't have a physical birth. And you might think, how, what does the, you know, how, uh, how the Buddha, for instance, what would he know about sexuality, you know? And, uh, you know, because he was celibate for most of his life. And, uh, but of course, we all know that uh, before he left the palace, before he left the home life, he was uh, into a, uh, born into a very well-to-do family. And uh, he was married at quite an early age, actually. Uh, and 
he recounts that actually that uh, he had three palaces. His father built him three palaces for the different seasons of the year in India. They have the three, the hot season, uh, the rainy season and the cold season. So we're in the cold season at the moment, <laughs> pretty much. And he said, and Buddha actually says this, I don't think it's just the, you know, the editors of his talks, as it were, the anonymous editors. He said that his father built a palace for each of these seasons, and the one that he built for the rainy season, all the staff in that palace were only female. The musicians, the guards, everyone was just female, was a female. So you can see that he, he obviously had a lot of access to um, sensual pleasure, sexuality, obviously had uh, access to the best in music, food, um, you know, scents, and all those things. So it's very important to, to see that. And maybe this is where the uh, Buddha's teaching, actually, one of the teachings I like a lot comes from, actually, because he, he talks about sense pleasures and he talks about seeing five aspects in sense pleasures. I hope it's five, I'm getting, yes. <laughs> the arising of them, the passing away of them, this is very important, actually, to see that they are temporary, that they don't last. But he also said, the Buddha said that there was pleasure or satisfaction in sense pleasures. He never denied that. And he called that the, he's called a sada in, uh, in Pali, the Pali language, Buddhist language. So he said, yes, there is uh, some happiness to be gained from sense pleasures. But he said there's also the danger or the drawback, the adinawa. These are the, the, um, the, 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 the pleasure and sense, uh, happiness and sense pleasures, of course, is what we get out of it, you know, the happiness that we get out of it. The adinawa, the drawback, the disadvantages of sense pleasures, they're impermanent. And I, I would add, usually they just say impermanent, but we get attached to them very much. So we have our favourite sense pleasures, whether it be uh, more innocuous things like tea and coffee. I see the people addicted to their coffee in the morning, getting their coffees when I go on arms round up to Carnegie. And so this is very minor compared to some of the addictions we can get into. It's, it's the nature of sense pleasures. They lead us to that, actually. And then the most important aspect of it was he taught the escape from sense pleasures, the nisarana. This is my name, actually, means escape. And this is uh, the way out, because for most people they only know sense pleasures. They know, that's the only form of happiness they know, what we get from hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting and touching. But the Buddha taught there was a way out, an escape, which is far, far more, far more satisfying. And that is the giving up the, of the delight in sense pleasures, looking for our happiness in sense pleasures. And why is that? Because when we have insight into the nature of reality, the deep insights of the uh, impermanence of things, the uh, unsatisfactoriness of things, and the fact that there is no permanent self to be found, when we see those things, the mind will turn away by itself from look, looking for happiness there, out in the five senses. And we've been trying that forever and a day, haven't we? <laughs> Looking for our happiness out there. But I'd like to read one of the teachings or the a quotation from the Buddha that really is striking, actually. When I first read this, I thought, wow, he's really putting it on the line, actually. <laughs> and uh, it's, the first, it's the first teaching from the collection called the Numerical Discourse of the Buddha, known as the Anguttara Nikaya in uh, Pali language, the Buddha's language. And I've abbreviated it, but the Buddha does each of these one by one to make a point, actually a strong point. And he says here, just see if you agree with this. <laughs> I think most people will recognize it as quite true. Because I do not see even one other thing that so obsesses the mind of a man as the form, and this is the abbreviation, the sound, the odor, the taste, the touch of a woman, these obsess the mind of a man. And with typical balance of the Buddha, he says, Bhikkhus, I do not see even one other thing that so obsesses the mind of a woman as the form, the sound, the odour, the taste, the touch of a man. These obsess the mind of a woman. So we have... Isn't that amazing teaching? I mean, how many spiritual teachers put it so much on the line? I can't believe it when I read that. I think, wow, that's really you know, upfront, we say. <laughs> 
but it's uh, very much where you know the whole teaching the Buddha gives on sexual misconduct is coming from seeing it in that perspective and seeing it as something that uh, keeps us in samsara keeps us going round keeps us connected to uh, impermanence um, unsatisfactoriness and the search for a permanent self so the title I gave to this talk was Hash Me Too, the Buddha's words on sexual misconduct. And for those who don't know what the Me Too movement was, I, I'm amazed if you don't. I mean, <laughs> it was in the news everywhere. And even I as a monk had heard of it, not, not in much detail, as much detail as I've now learned because I'm here and there's Wi-Fi and you know, I'm giving a talk on sexual misconduct. So I learn a lot actually. And so the movement, uh, just to read from the, 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 the most uh, quoted source these days, Wikipedia. <laughs> I think everybody quotes Wikipedia. Let's hope they've got it right. The Me Too movement is a movement against sexual harassment and assault. Hash Me Too spread virally, as I use this word these days, in October two th 2017, only last year. Feels like a long time ago to me. As a hashtag used on social media, in an attempt to demonstrate the widespread prevalence of sexual assault and harassment, especially in the workplace. But of course it's in other places too, like schools and uh, any and religious organisations, not exempted. And it followed soon after the sexual misconduct allegations against Harvey Weinstein. So that's the, that gives you some of the... And many, um, as a result, this was met with a lot of... Uh, um, feedback. They give you the number of hits and so on um, from uh, on Wikipedia. It's huge. Just in one day, in 24 hours, it's huge response. And of course, many uh, high-profile people came out and talked about Me Too. The the thing, of course, is with Me Too, isn't it? Is it's really is showing that they too have suffered from uh, sexual harassment, sexual abuse in their lives, and this is something that. Uh, uh, draws us together in a way. In Thailand, they say we're all brothers and sisters in old age, sickness, and death. We are certainly in this too. This is part of it. So, this is very. It's. A, I think it's a, a development um, that what it pointed to has been going on probably for a long time. Become more more or less accepted or not acknowledged. So, this is something that's good to bring up. So, what is sexual misconduct? I must admit, I thought the only Buddhist used this term, <laughs> sexual misconduct. I'd never heard of it much until recent times. But now you see it in newspapers and you hear it on the uh, internet. They're using it quite a lot because it's such a vague term. I don't know what, when, when I hear sexual misconduct, my mind goes blank. I don't know if you're the same, but I just think, what does it mean? <laughs> You know, we just think, you know, adultery or something like that, and we leave it at that. But of course, the Buddha had meant a lot more by it. And again, from Wikipedia, I just give the little definition of this is uh, not a Buddhist definition, but it's, it comes close to it. Sexual misconduct is an umbrella term for any misconduct of a sexual nature that is of lesser offense than criminal sexual assault, such as rape or molestation particularly where it occurs in a situation that normally isn't a sexual context. Common theme and the reason for the term misconduct is that these violations occur during work, at school, etc., in a situation of power imbalance. So that's it. So that is, that's uh, talking about uh, sexual, uh, sexual misconduct in a uh, more worldly sense. But I thought at this time it might, might be good to lighten up because it gets a bit heavy otherwise. And this is a Nazarudin story that relates to it. Nazarudin, uh, as I mentioned, was a uh, Sufi teacher. Some may think as a Sufi saint. And I think a lot of these stories that from Nazarudin actually developed after his life. Some of them probably had their origin during his life. This one, for instance, could not have come from 13th century Turkey or a little bit earlier, I suspect. Um, where Nasrudin lived. And uh, Nasrudin was in England and he was very impressed that uh, bosses in England, or many bosses, hopefully not all, would take their secretaries to Paris and pretend that they were their wives. The secretary was their wives. And Nasrudin thought, 
oh, as I don't have a secretary, what if I take my wife to Paris and pretend that she's my secretary? <laughs> <laughs> That's typical Nazarut and getting it the wrong way around. But it is true, isn't it? So he's going to take his wife to Paris and pretend she's his secretary. <laughs> so quite, quite, uh, quite interesting. But uh, now it's very good to focus on what the Buddha said about sexual misconduct because we haven't got that much time actually. But the important thing that the Buddha always emphasised, you know, in uh, in the Vinaya for the monks and the nuns, but um, also I think in the Dhamma, that we need to observe the law of the land as well. This is very important uh, that we we uh, we do comply to that. I suspect the only uh, exception would be if the law of the land was uh, immoral or was against, uh, you know, against an ethical um, an aspect of the uh, five precepts. But of course, the Buddha's guidance is what we're mainly interested in in this context. What did he say? And it's good to keep in mind at the time of the Buddha, it's not like our time. Polygamy was very common, so the kings had um, a number of wives, usually big harems, they probably didn't call them harems, and uh, wealthy, wealthy householders would also have a number of wives. Like I think it was Chitta, the householder, had four wives. And uh, I will mention uh, a story about that too in a minute, if, I, if it comes in, I think. And also to, to mention that it, you can see his attitude to sexuality is, is very different, say, from where we come, come from in a Christian society or a society that's influenced by Christianity. Because a lot of his, uh, some of his uh, disciples, they became nuns, were courtesans. And these are courtesans, uh, um, I think my understanding of it is they are women who entertain men and there's a sexual aspect to it as well as being entertaining, interesting, maybe they're good singers, you know, they, they have an all-round uh, qualities. And so some of these, a very famous one, I think uh, the traditional Buddhists here will know Amber Pali. Do you know Amber Pali? She was a, a courtesan. She uh, actually, uh, she used to, that was her living and she was very, very uh, successful at it and uh, made a lot of money from that. And it's really interesting because she became fully enlightened. And you read her poem, uh, her verses, in the Terigata. Gata. This is the verses of the enlightened nuns. And they're really incredibly strong because she was so beautiful. And then she's writing this when she's old and she's reflecting on how all this beauty is gone, you know, and, um, and she doesn't miss it at all because she's found a much, <laughs> a much greater happiness than the beauty that has gone. It's impermanent, had to be impermanent. So the Buddha wasn't judging these people. He wasn't thinking of them as, you know, often in, in a uh, Christian society, we might think of them as sinful or, you know, sometimes people would even say evil. And he never had that, uh, that view and it wasn't common in the society. What he would say that uh, often uh, sexual misconduct arises from is just from ignorance thinking this will lead to happiness, um, that uh, this will lead to you know, what we're looking for. And of course, if, if we act in a negative way, in a wholesome way, the results have to be of the same nature. Because the Buddha was uh, the principal teaching, actually, that underpins the Buddha's teaching, is that everything comes from a cause and a condition, and that gives rise to a result. So in this case, our ignorance that uh, sexual misconduct is actually leading to our harm, not only our harm, but other people's harm, is the reason why people uh, um, ind indulge in it, because they think that it's bringing them happiness. The Buddha had a very nice saying, was it? Um, uh, apasuka bahudukha, apasuka bahudukha. And this, this summarizes his, his attitude to sense pleasures, actually. Little happiness, a lot of suffering or unsatisfactoriness. Little happiness, a lot of uns. So it's a, it's a good saying, isn't it? Appa, sukha, bahu dukkha. And of course, when he uh, uses this term, kame sumichachara, as I mentioned earlier, it's really, it, it's, it encompasses sensuality, so that's seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. But the example he always gives is sexuality, because this is the strongest one. And sometimes I call it like the taproot 
of samsara. It's what keeps us going in samsara. So even though it does refer to the five senses, it's really um, focusing on sexuality. The Buddha, Buddha focused on it. And this is a translation that Bhikkhu Bodhi gives. I've actually uh, modified the gender so it's more uh, gender inclusive, we say these days. So, because uh, the examples are always from the, uh, it's talking about women, but it applies to men just as well. He engages in sexual misconduct he or she has relations, I should have had the he or she at the beginning, missed. <laughs> he or she has sexual relations with women or men who are protected by their mother, father, mother and father, brother, sister or relatives, who are protected by their dhamma, interesting isn't it? Who have a husband or a wife or a partner whose violation entails a penalty or even one already engaged. And then the Buddha always expressed it in the, the positive to having abandoned sexual misconduct. He or she abstains from sexual misconduct. He or she does not have sexual relations with women or men, really boys and girls actually you'd say, who are protected by their mother, father, mother and father, brother or sister or relatives, who are protected by their dhamma, who have a husband or a wife or a partner whose violation entails a penalty, or even one already engaged. So these are the five categories the Buddha is talking about, and uh, we'll go into them in a little bit more detail. And Bhikkhu Bodhi, he, he gives us an idea what some of these terms are, like one protected by their dhamma. Now that's a bit, a bit uh, we're not, not clear what that means. Um, and the, and the, the old translations, they used to have things like very strange, actually, female convicts, <laughs> female convicts. So uh, but that is one category of person that cannot give their consent because they're imprisoned. You know, a person who is in prison is very vulnerable. So the, the Bhikkhu Bodhi says the last four, so the first one is the uh, um, person uh, who is protected by the Dhamma, is a woman or a man protected by his co-religionists. And my understanding of that would be like a Buddhist monk or nun, we have vows of celibacy, so that, uh, that protects us, and people, um, by and large, uh, respect that, actually. And of course, other um, Christian traditions, they have uh, monks and nuns, priests, who are also observing celibacy, or should be. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, the second category is one already married, we had that, and he says it's all even promised to a husband or a wife at birth or in childhood. It's a bit unimaginable for us. You know, babies just born and then they're, they're already betrothed, as it were, to somebody, somebody else. But it happens in India, happened in India, and it's probably still happening, actually. Um, and one with whom sexual relations entail punishment. And this, of course, is, you know, with the government, the would, you know, something that was against the law, basically. And a girl or boy who has been garlanded by a, a man or a woman as a sign of engagement. And now I give Ajahn Brahm's translation because it's, it's very interesting. I think much you know, in some ways gives a clearer picture. Uh, there are some things uh, that uh, he puts very well. Having abandoned, he, he puts it it's ju uh, gender neutral, which is very nice. Having abandoned sexual misconduct, you abstain from sexual misconduct. You do not have sexual relations with those who are under, under the age of consent. They can't give their consent, really. With those who are unable to give consent, and he says here, e.g. being mentally disabled, that sort of person can't give their consent, no position to. Who are not free to refuse consent, such as a student to their teacher. I wonder if they're supposed to be the married person too, because they're, not, they're you know, literally not free to give their consent. Um, where such, and the next one, where such conduct would be breaking the law, breaking a law, or even with one already engaged. So there are the five categories that Ajahn Brahm talks about, and I think they're quite good. So I mentioned them in a little bit more detail. First one, of course, is underage, you know, children in the, 
Qualification for uh, the age of becoming an adult varies, of course, from society to society, from time to time. And now, in say, in Australia, it's 18, isn't it? It's still 18, I think, to be regarded as an adult, that you can make a choice and you can consent or not consent to uh, in, uh, sexual involvement. In other societies, it will be different. And, you know, at the time of the Buddha, for instance, he... As a bodhisattva, I think he was married about 13, 13. He and his wife were married 13, something like that. Very young, you know, very young. And, of course, uh, part of the reason why this is sexual misconduct is that they can't choose. They haven't got uh, the ability to choose. They haven't got the experience to, to draw on, uh, to make a, uh, an informed decision. So our parents or guardians are looking after the children at this stage for their well-being and happiness. It's not an easy job these days. <laughs> Kids are growing up very fast, aren't they? So it's you know, because of internet and everything. And it's good to, to remember that even if a child goes along with sexual misconduct and gets involved, that's still sexual misconduct because they have, they're not in a position to, to make that sort of choice because it's in a power imbalance too if it's an, another adult. Um, and also one thing that one I've seen, I think most of you have probably heard of it, or, you know, either directly from people you know or maybe even your own experience, that what, what an impact sexual assault or sexual misconduct where a child's concerned, what an uh, impact it has on their whole life. And uh, I'm, I, I remember this uh, man who came to the monastery and he... He had been uh, sexually abused by his father when he was a child. And he said that he was in a psychoanalysis for 20 years after that. And, you know, he, he was coming to the monastery and so on. And uh, I could see he struggled. He really struggled. And he had a lot of problems uh, as a result of that. And this is very true of sexual abuse. You know, it's... Uh, it's uh, the results are long lived, actually, very long lived. And uh, the other thing to also remember, and the videos last night brought this out, that sometimes the abuser is not actually an adult. There's, that can happen at schools and so on, that it's another underage person, probably older, you know, older person. And one of the things that came out in these videos, very unfortunate in a way, it's obvious that it's, that it's more the case, that most of the videos, all the videos, were about girls that were being abused by uh, either an older man or uh, an older boy. And so this is, uh, you know, something that um, we have to keep in mind. That this is sometimes uh, children, as it were, still are abusing their other children. So. But what we have to do as, as parents or, you know, as being concerned for their well-being is actually to teach them to say no that they have a right to say no, and they don't have to consent. And they, they can show that lack of consent in any way they wish. And these videos that we saw last night, they demonstrated too that, you know, you can change your mind at any time during, uh, you know, an act, sexual activity. So, and it's very important that parents and uh, ch uh, inform their children or that they have some idea of this because then they're ready, prepared for when it happens. Because if it happens to a child, what are they going to do? You know, they have, they have, they don't know anything about it. They will be at sea and they'll get lost. So that's the first and the most uh, charged one, isn't it? Underaged is very much charged um, in terms of sexual misconduct. And uh, also the next one, as I mentioned, was those that uh, are protected by their dhamma. That's a very uh, interesting sort of phrase. And as I said, I think of uh, celibate uh, Buddhist monks or nuns or Christian monks and nuns, priests too. Um, some of them are celibate. So they can't give their consent either because they have these vows or they shouldn't give their consent. And uh, of course, you know, if, uh, if, if they're involved in a sexual activity, then it's breaking their uh, vows, breaking their rules, and that would be considered sexual misconduct. I mean, amazingly, I mean, if you read the vinaya uh, for the, the, the Buddhist vinaya, the, the vinaya that's the rules for monks and nuns, you won't believe some of the things that happened in the time of the Buddha. You know, it's just extraordinary that uh, what, was, what happened in terms of these sort of 
sexual matters with monks and nuns and the lay people. And we also remember, and I think it's very aware, that now there's a lot of uh, scandal, isn't there, often associated with the various traditions. Catholic Church is going through a lot. <laughs> and the Pope, I think, just recently in Ireland has been uh, encountering a lot of protests and so forth over sexual abuse uh, in the Catholic Church. But it happens in Buddhism too, because we had we were cases of Sogol Rinpoche, people remember the the author of the Tibetan book of Living and Dying. He was involved in a scandal. And most recently, another uh, he's, not, he's not a monk, actually. He's not a monk, so he's not celibate, actually. That's a good point. And Shambhala, the chief teacher of Shambhala, he was recently uh, involved in a scandal um, and has resigned from that position. But then he wasn't a celibate either. And his father was Trogyam, uh, Trogyam Trungpa, Probably uh, Trumpa, yeah, who was very well known for me, being somewhat of a scallywag. Uh, so, but one thing I would emphasise that being a monk or nun, particularly a forest monk or nun, you know, where we practice a lot of meditation, we are looking at the mind. We are looking at the effect of the defilements on the mind. This is what makes our practice either Buddha said this either easy or uh, easy and happy or slow and uh, difficult is the is degree of defilement in the mind. The more defilement we have, the more unpleasant it is, the more suffering there is involved. The less, the more pleasant. And uh, the more defilements we have, it can be a longer pro. It can be either quick or fast. Sometimes people get through it quickly. But one of the defilements we see coming up is a raga, we call it in the Pali word. This is sexual desire. So really, even though monks and nuns are celibate, they still have conditioning from the past, some very strong. And so then they have to deal with this uh, you know, sexual desire that's coming up. And when you have to deal with it, you get a bit of an insight on what's going on, well, how it's really working in the mind. Is it really happiness? How the process unfolds, you know, that uh, the mind creates this, uh, we call it the subanimata, it makes something look very attractive. It's like when you put a, a nice filter on a camera lens, you know, it might give a nice colour, rosy tint or whatever. We do it with our minds. And then we can only see the, the beautiful aspects, the perfect aspects, etc., of that person or that situation. So this is something that spiritual people, if you are a meditator, you get to see. And it's very good to get to see. Not always easy. Not always easy. And uh, then the, uh, included in that, uh, no, another category is here, that's right. Ajahn Brahm mentions those, uh, this is another one, those unable to give consent. Um, and this may be what he's meaning by those, uh, the ones we just talked about, those protected by their Dhamma. It could be uh, included there. But his example actually is people who are mentally disabled, so they can't give their consent, you know, they haven't got the, uh, the mental capability to really give their consent. And then, of course, we have married people, uh, married persons, or people in committed relationships, because it's not only, um, uh, you know, uh, officially or legally married uh, uh, situations, it's also committed relationships, and usually this is adultery, as we, as we know. Um, this is cheating on one's partner, deceiving, lying to them, and so on. It's very interesting a point. Some people raise this in terms of sexual misconduct. Is it sexual misconduct if the partners in a relationship agree that one or other of them can have sexual relationships outside that marriage or that commitment? This is a question that people ask. I have heard of it, but... Uh, whether that sexual misconduct is something difficult to say, I would usually say to people, it's dynamite. <laughs> Dino, you're playing with dynamite. <laughs> no matter how good you, 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 know, you might think, you, how uh, well wishing you for your partner, when it happens, it, it may not be like that. So. I think it's a nice idea, yeah, but anyway. If it doesn't, I think the reality is not quite that. 
But on the more positive side, I was going to mention Chitta the Householder. I tried to look for the reference for this and couldn't find it, actually, but he was an anagami in the time of the Buddha, and the Buddha said that amongst lay people, he was the only lay person that he said was the foremost in teaching the Dhamma. He used to teach monks. <laughs> he was so, so good. He was an anagami. And he had four wives. He had four wives. But when he became an anagami, of course, an anagami is a person that's given up all negative, ill will, hatred, and they've also given up all sensuality, including sexuality, you know. They've no, their happiness is not coming from the five senses, not interested. So he said to his wives, he gave them the choice, he said, look, <laughs> I'm no longer, you know, sort of interested at all. And he gave them the choice what they wanted to do with their lives. Some of them, one or two of them got remarried, some of them didn't get remarried. Um, you know, and just stayed with him. I think one stayed with him and so on to live like as a sister, like a sister and so forth. So this is where, you know, you can see, you know, uh, somebody whose practice has really uh, developed and they can do that. And I think it was very kind, wasn't it, to, to give them the choice, just say, what do you want to do <laughs> with your lives? And against the law, this is another category. This is much easier for us to, and this is where the Me Too campaign fits in, doesn't it? These things are against the law. So those who are not, this is Ajahn Brahm's category, is those not free to refuse consent. This comes under, I think, against the law. Uh, would entail a penalty. And this is such as students and uh, students to their teachers. Because this can be a terrible one because it's very difficult for students to, re to say no, to refuse their teachers. And maybe we could also, you know, and this is a, an area that one of the videos touched on last night uh, as well, because it's something that comes up uh, in students' lives and teachers' lives. And also maybe prisoners could be included in here because they don't have, uh, those not free to refuse consent, they, they don't have that ability. They're in prison and um, they can, they have less power over the, what happens to them. So this, of course, is all non-consensual sex. So this is where people don't give their consent, and this particularly rape or use of force is is a very uh, is a is a very easy area to see actually. And this is, a, but one of the things that comes out with it, with this uh, with uh, sexual misconduct, and it, it applies to all aspects of sexual misconduct, and it came out in the video last night that often people think it's their fault. They'll blame themselves. And particularly for children, you see this, they take blame or they think they're responsible for what happened. Which is, you know, it, as an adult, you look at it and think, crazy? <laughs> no, that's not, the, not why it happened, the sexual misconduct. And they'll often think that uh, I'm a bad person because of what happened. So this is guilt that's really getting, it's my fault, I'm to blame. And this is part of the shame that a lot of young people feel when they, they experience sexual misconduct that makes it very, very hard to tell someone they trust. Someone, you know, because they feel ashamed and they think, well, maybe they're responsible, you know. And in actual fact, when I read some of these stories and people who had been sexually assaulted, had sexual misconduct, experienced sexual misconduct, and they said it was when they actually realized that they weren't responsible, that freed them, actually. It wasn't their fault. And that's very good to see. And uh, the last category we mentioned was engaged, and I think that's, you know, people who have got a commitment to each other and that to get married or to go into a committed relationship. And it's good to also focus on what the Buddha didn't say was sexual misconduct. And one of the areas that he didn't mention, and there's a lot of areas he doesn't mention uh, in uh, those five categories, isn't there? is uh, uh, like, for instance, gay sexuality doesn't mention that at all. So those sorts of, um, the ideas that that is sexual misconduct does come up in other traditions, the Buddhist traditions even, later, but not from the Buddha, not from the Buddha at all. And it's, uh, it's very, uh, maybe just to, to finish off soon, but to, just to, to fit uh, essential, de essential uh, sexual misconduct into and sensual desire in, into the framework of the Buddha's teaching. How does it work? Because uh, we see that, for instance, sexual desire is coming from uh, which 
Which unwholesome root? It has to be an unwholesome root. <laughs> Do you know what it is? Loba. This is wanting. This is greed. This sort of getting. It's a very strong root. It's actually the main root of samsara. Actually, it's what keeps us here. We want. We want to get. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's the main unwholesome root. And of course, that leads to uh, the wanting of tanha. This is uh, the wanting that leads to attachment. We get attached to some of these sense pleasures. And also, very importantly, not only is it you know, coming from the unwholesome root of greed, it comes from the unwholesome root of, uh, we say, viapada. This is ill will, aversion. Because if we don't get what we want, and you see this often in sexual misconduct, if the person doesn't get what they want, they can turn to violence because they're not getting what they want. So it's a, it's a, it's a very nasty sort of situation, uh, can be. And, of course, it fits into the Buddhist teaching of dependent arising, or in uh, Pali, paticca samapada. And uh, it's just amazing. When I look at the Buddha's teachings, I think it's almost like a scientist, isn't it? It's just so extraordinary the way he can stand back and, and just see it so clearly. And sometimes, you know, I look at his teachings and I think, well, it can't be that simple. It can't be. <laughs> you know, that it's just six senses that we have and with these five aspects of body and mind. When I look at it, I think there's nothing else that I can find, you know. I think, wow, really, it all seems so much more complicated and difficult. <laughs> but uh, when you read the words, you think, yep, that's it, that's right. Uh, so he says, because of consciousness, because vijnana, we experience body and mind. And because we have a body and mind, we have six senses to contact the world. Because we have six senses, we have contact with seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching the objects, and thinking, and thinking to thought. And because of that contact, we have feelings that arise, dependent on these six types of contact or experience. And the feelings are usually, and this simplifies life incredibly, either pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling, or neutral. And this is the range of our response to these things, actually, the basic tone of it, actually. Um, and we are always after pleasant feeling. We don't want unpleasant feeling. We are running away from that as much as possible, <laughs> especially if it's painful, uh, pleasant, unpleasant feeling. A neutral feeling, we ignore. So very, uh, And from that feeling, if it's pleasant, we want it, we'll go for it usually. If it's unpleasant, we want to get rid of it as quickly as possible. And the things we go for, we want, we like, then we have to keep them, we have to be attached to them, we want them again. And so you can see lots and lots of, of um, uh, we call them attachments or addictions that people develop. They can uh, develop addictions to anything, really. Sex is, a, is obvious, an obvious one, but telephones, you know, smartphones these days, people are pretty much addicted to that. You're glued to it, <laughs> can't exist without it. And then from that wanting and that clinging, to, uh, that attachment that we, we, uh, uh, we develop towards these sense, pleasant sense uh, ple uh, pleasures, pleasant feelings, then we, uh, we, we exist in that sort of world. So for instance, the, it creates the sort of world we live in actually. And from that, we will, when we're reborn, when we pass away, and we're born again, we'll go to a world that matches a sort of mental environment we've created. We call it bawa, but it's a mental environment that we create. And you can see some people really, their mental environment they can create, you can see heaven and hell. <laughs> it's like in our own experience, let alone other people's, you know, that uh, they can live. They're here on the earth with everybody else. You know, and sometimes people say to me, is there a heaven or a hell? And I said, well, you can see it. I can see it in other people's lives. I see it in my life too. It's here. And this is the bower. This is where we're hanging out. And these places that we hang out in this life tend to condition where we hang out the next life. It's a continuation. It's uh, related. And then it gives rise to what the Buddha said, birth, old age, sickness and death, and as well as the mental component of suffering or unsatisfactoriness. And of course, the interesting thing with all that is that in, you see this actually, that in, in uh, our, uh, you know, this life, that people are attracted often to the same sorts of people again and again. Often can be positive, 
you know, they start relationships with people and they're a very similar character. Character or appearance is often is a defining factor too. Or reverse, they're always getting involved with somebody who's doing no good for them. <laughs> and uh, and uh, one could reflect this is coming from karma, certainly karma in this life. Karma creating karma vipaka, this is results, causes and, and conditions creating results. But possibly from past lives. Because sometimes you see people encounter this, they meet people who they feel enormously close to, have an affinity with, other people they feel very uh, negative towards for no reason. So, so it's now 10.30. I'd just like to maybe just touch on a few few points. They're important, but anyway, we'll see. Just mention that, that really one of the dynamite areas for sexuality and sexual misconduct in our lives is romantic love and uh, sex, sexuality. And... Uh, because this, this weaves this sort of tale, I'd call it fairy tale. I say, is it a fairy tale or real life, sexual, uh, um, romantic love? You know, some of the things you see, you know, just in, in Sri Lanka I've seen, I won't go into the videos, but I've seen music videos that are all about love, ardore, and my goodness. I thought anybody that sees this would say, don't go that way. <laughs> Because inevitably the person dies in the end. They have a lot of trauma in between. It doesn't look like any fun at all. So, and also I think, you know, we, we see it in, in the media too, don't we? Because I remember very well, as you, some of you will, not all of you, when Princess Diana and Prince Charles got married. And that was like a fairy tale. Wow, what happened to the fairy tale? You know, what happened to it? Maybe it was just a media spin, but presumably they did have some romance at some time. And now, the reason it comes to my mind is because of Megan and Prince Harry, you know, because I think it's like a rerun, you know, and you think, oh, I hope they do better. I hope they do better than that. And I also think, uh, one, one of the, I remember from my lay life, one of the songs, I remember this line always, always came back to me. It's a very cynical line about love, actually. And it's a song from Linda Ronstadt. I don't even know the song now. And she says, she sings in this song, she says, Did you think forever would last the whole night? Did you think forever would last the whole night? I thought, wow. <laughs> this is romance, isn't it? Romance says it's going to last forever. It's going to, you know, we'll go off into the sunset together. Romance is not getting up the next morning with a headache and going to school or taking the kids this to, to kinder or wherever. And this, the conditioning factors, I see it in my life extraordinarily well, you know, that uh, the songs I used to listen to when I was young and uh, even the movies and books, oh, my goodness, I think the messages in them just, oh, they're off this planet, I think, you know. I can see them now, but I think the kids, these are conditioning things that our children are experiencing here and now. But one of the things that comes from this is that we can, uh, I call it emotional first aid, we can actually give the love that we're looking for to ourselves. This is metta or maitri, loving kindness. And this is a very important thing. Usually, as I mentioned a number of times, one teacher, he's a um, Hare Krishna teacher in India, he's a motivational speaker, he's very world famous now. Um, Gaur Gopal Das, I think some of you may have heard of him, he's on YouTube, but who isn't? Uh, he said, if you want to receive love, you may not, but if you want to give love, who can stop you? And that is true. If you give love, if you develop metta, maitri, you're giving yourself what you, you want, what you're looking for. So many people are looking at, out there for Mr. Right, Miss Right, and they, that is an, a demand that they may not be able to meet. And immediately the other person senses, oh, this person wants a lot from me. I don't know if I can give it. So it makes for very difficult relationships. But when we come from a sense of satisfying our own needs in terms of love, security, approval, appreciation, we can do it for ourselves. Then we can be in relationships that are much better, less driven by need. And this is an important thing. And uh, I always remember one of the things that uh, Ajahn Brahm said this in a talk at the monastery that I think is very, very true. We often think it's the other person that's making us feel in love, feel so happy, so wonderful, at least for two years. Sometimes they say three years. But uh, after that, well, who knows? But, uh, he says, and I think this is very true, what we love, what we fall in love with 
It's the feeling we get inside because of that person. That person's like a trigger, but the feeling that we like is actually in us. It's not them. It's not coming from them. It's coming from us. So that's an important way to to view this whole, uh, you know, romantic love. Uh, 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 to see that actually we're doing it to ourselves. <laughs> And it's a, for a person who's practicing, this is an interesting insight to see where it's coming from. So my concluding remark, so we can just have so many questions, I think it's a pretty topical thing. Uh, my concluding remark, as I said to the children last night, to, or children, teenagers, young adults really, uh, may you not have to say, hash me too. So this is what I wish for all of us. Most of us here are old enough that we probably have our own experience of sexual misconduct, so we know what it's about. And hopefully we don't wish it upon anybody else. That's the most important thing. Often human nature is not quite like that. Once abused, they say the abuser can be, be abuse others in a similar way. Let's not be like that. So, let's, so that we can say that, not uh, hash me too. So I'd like to finish there and thank you for listening. It's a difficult subject, but I think it's one well worth going into. You know, um, the, What the kids experienced last night was probably more fun and interesting because of the video. <laughs> this is all talk. So um, are there any questions that people have from... Uh, oh, is it on the internet? Yeah, yes, three, all right. All right, just see if I can, if we've got time. So you don't hear talks on sexual misconduct very, very often, but it's quite an important so, subject. So first question here is, um, humans have senses. Yes. How can you be fully human without enjoying them? How can you be fully human without enjoying them? Yes, human, humans have senses, animals have senses, insects have senses. You know, we'd say other beings that we can't see have senses as well, you know, uh, different sorts of bodies and so forth. But what makes us humans actually is not our senses, but... The, um, the ethical standards we live by. Ajahn Chah said that, you know, he said, <laughs> he said, you know, what makes us a real human being is if we're keeping the five precepts. That makes us a human being. When we have a standard we're living by, the standard of just indulging the five senses, in actual fact, you know, uh, I would say, you know, that the consequence of really indulging it will be to go to a rebirth where you can really experience it to the max. So for somebody who's really into sense pleasures, animal realm is quite, is, is, is a very good place, you know, especially for sexuality. It can be unhindered. So I would say it's not the senses that make us truly human. It's our ethical, ethical values that make us human. I hope that was uh, of, uh, of use. Yeah. It comes also from Ajahn Chah. Okay. This is uh, from uh, Texas. Texas. Oh, hello, Texas. It must be terribly late at night or something, I think. I don't know what the time in Texas is. But these, these days there is a lot of uh, virtue mm. signaling and shaming, particularly on the internet. Yeah. In your opinion, what would be the best Buddhist response when one encounters this? Yes, it's difficult. What was the first word? Shaming, what was the first word before that? I didn't hear it. It's not virtue. So let me read the question again. These days there is a lot of virtue s signaling and virtue shaming. Virtue signaling, oh, yeah. right. Particularly on the internet. In mm. your opinion, what would be the best Buddhist response when one encounters this? Right, I'm, I'm not sure. Virtue signaling, I think that's like uh, taking a high moral standard, is it? And looking down on others, shaming them because of that? Maybe, that's what they mean, I'm not sure. But... I think oftentimes uh, the best thing is not to, to get involved in it, <laughs> is not start the debate. And uh, uh, if you do, you know, the best thing is just to really to go to the, the ultimate source, which is the Buddha, what he said, an enlightened uh, view on that particular subject. You know, that's end of, end of story then. You can just say, the Buddha said this, and uh, it seems like quite a good standard, you know. So that, perhaps that's the a way that you could um, could respond just you just give as a matter of fact you know what the Buddha said and leave it at that of course there, there are many interpretations so that's the problem so I hope that uh, that would be always my uh, bottom line would be the Buddha what the Buddha said so yeah, yeah.
Well, there's Could two. Be. There's two more, but they're not quite on the topic. So, All right. Yeah. Uh, yes. So if there's Are any questions here? Any others on the topic? Oh, you're all too stunned. <laughs> you're all too stunned. You think, oh, I don't believe it. It's from the talk, uh, John. Yes. Um, you mentioned there was a, a lay person who became an anagami. Yes, that was Chitta, the uh, householder. He was, uh, the Buddha said, he was the foremost in teaching uh, lay person, foremost lay person in teaching the Dhamma. So he understood it really well, yeah. So my question was, how far could a lay person go with the Dhamma? How, you know, how far would the Sangha understand a lay person could go with the Dhamma? Well, they, they say, they say that they can go as far as Anagami. I've never, you know, I've never read where the Buddha said that, but uh, that's what is commonly accepted. And they say that if you become an Arahant, that you, um, as a lay person, then you should ordain as soon as possible. And certainly someone that uh, you know, becomes fully enlightened, there is not much purpose for hanging, in the, hanging about in the world. But there's a lot of purpose, a lot of good can be achieved by actually being in the Sangha, maybe being able to teach. Not that all Arahants can teach, but that could be you know, the purpose to serve, to have compassion for people. That, that's very strong. Then that can be of great use. So that, that will, that's what I understand. But the actual source for that I can't, can't quote. I sometimes wonder, yeah. But you never hear of an arahant, uh, a lay person is an arahant, that's for sure. You know, don't. So thank you for that question, yeah. Okay. Cheer to the householder. If a lay person uh, gives up the world, not necessarily putting on robes, mm. he may still see as a lay person, mm. but he can get enlightened. Can get enlightened. He certainly can get, you know, in, um, in the suttas, he certainly can get to Anagami, which is fantastic. He may be able to get to Arahant too, I'm not sure. But uh, I don't, I have never seen where the Buddha said that, you know, but it's probably more from the commentaries. But you never, you don't read, I've never read in the suttas where somebody who's a lay person was an Arahant, fully enlightened Arahant. But uh, Anagami, yes, that's all I've ever read. So, but uh, I can't say, really. Mm. Yes, Jenny, is it Jenny? Jenny? Julie, that's right, Julie. I knew it began with a J. <laughs> Thanks. Very good. Thanks, Sarjan. Yeah. Um, I have a question, and I don't want to minimise um, sexual abuse or no, right, mis good, good. misconduct, no. but I'm just wondering, what's the Buddha's take on karma when that happens to someone? You know, oh. whether you'll be abused or yes. is, um, without minimising that it's really wrong and that yes. the society needs to address it, etc. I'm yes. just wondering about that. I think that's a good good point. I think there is some karma there because, as I mentioned to you just when I was ending, that um, in this life, people that have been abused tend to become can tend to become abusers. I don't know the statistics. This is karma working. You know, they had the, uh, uh, they experienced the sexual abuse and, and now they become the abuser. So this is the workings of karma. The causes and conditions were there for them to become abusers. Not everybody does, though. Some people, as I say, they think, it happened to me, I don't want it to happen to anybody else, especially my children or, you know, anyone else. It was bad enough for me. But as I say, it seems to be a common uh, experience that abusers, People who have been abused will become abused. That's karma. That's karma straight away. Karma uh, and then karma vipaka. It's resulted, the causes and conditions of that abuse have resulted in further abuse. So you can see the law of karma operating in that sense, conditionality operating. So from, in terms of previous lives, who knows? I think quite often things can be coming from previous lives. But you'd never wish it upon another person, for sure, you know. Um, and uh, as I say, if we create good karma in our present life in, of, a, of a similar nature to, say, perhaps a, um, undoing sexual abuse, giving support to people who have been abused and so forth, give support generally, that is a way we can reduce any negative karma, that we, we, karma we parka, any negative results that may come from that karma from the past. So helping or assisting others, always good, yeah, always good. So that, I, I think, um, you know, that's all one can say. You can't say definitely from past life, you know. 
So, I think now we have to... That. Thank so you. very good. Thank you yeah. very much for coming this morning and nice day. And now, happy Father's Day for the rest of the day. And we can pay, pay respects to the Buddha Dhamma and Sangha if you wish.